I'm very glad to introduce again Jeff Hawkins. I say again because uh, he has been one of the long-term supporters of the Center for Brains, Minds and Machines and our vision of an engineering of intelligence based on the science of intelligence. Um, that is cognitive science and neuroscience. So I introduced him at the first time uh, as a speaker of our then Intelligence Initiative seminar series in 2010, so that's uh, seven years ago. He's the founder, as everybody knows, of Palm Computing and Handspring, and uh, as such, uh, he has been a legend in Silicon Valley for quite some time. In 2003, he was elected as a member of the National Academy of Engineering for the creation of the handheld computing paradigm and the creation of the first commercially successful example of a handheld computing device. He has a deep connection with MIT. In its infinite wisdom, the MIT Computer Science Admission Office, representing, I note, the other side of Asser Street, not this one, rejected Jeff's application to the iLab. <laughs> and so made it possible for him to invent handheld computers and for us to have iPads and the like. So Jeff uh, wrote a, a book which is in the meantime is a classic book on intelligence, that's 2004, describing his memory prediction framework theory of the brain. He then started to maintain the belief that it's time for computer science to learn from the brain and for making computers more similar to the brain. Jeff and I agreed then on the belief that the time had come for a new attack on the problem of AI, um, and that neuroscience would provide important cues. He wrote the initiative, this was the intelligence initiative, the precursor of the CBMM. The initiative is exciting. Um, over the last 30 years, I have seen many intelligence initiatives come and go, but the positioning and thought behind high square, that was the term, intelligence initiative, is the best I've seen. MIT is the ideal location for an initiative like this. And since then, companies such as Mobileye and especially DeepMind, which were then uh, just tiny startups when they participated in the MIT symposium Brains, Minds and Machine, which were organized in 2011, those companies have achieved a lot of success in AI by using two main algorithms, reinforcement learning and deep learning. And both, both of such algorithms were initially inspired long ago by cognitive science and neuroscience. So because of this, when I'm asked um, what will be the next breakthrough in AI, of course I answer that I don't know, but uh, that it is a reasonable bet that it will also come from neuroscience. And it may well come from, for looking in more details at the anatomy and function of the layers in each cortical areas. And this is what Jeff would speak about. The title is, have we missed half of what the neocortex does? Allocentric location as the basis for perception. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Hawkins. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. That was very generous. And, um, and it's nice to be back here. Uh, I, I do view MIT as really uh, setting the agenda in the field that, uh, that I like to participate in. And I almost completely forgot about the fact that I had been, my application for a graduate program here was rejected <laughs> many years ago. Uh, that's good. So I don't hold anything against you guys. Um, uh, anyway, so uh, yes, this is how my talk, and I won't explain it other than I'll just jump right into it here. Um, just a, I just figured a, a few words about my company, because it's a bit unusual. Um, Nementa is a small business in Northern California. We're really like a private research lab. Uh, it, there's 12 people. We're almost completely uh, dedicated to neocortical theory and um, scientists and engineers. We have a rather ambitious goal which is to reverse engineer the neocortex. Uh, I'm not embarrassed to say that. It's an ambitious goal. It's achievable. We should all be working on it one way or the other. And our, um, our approach is a very detailed biological approach. We want to understand how the, the neurons and the circuitry, as we see it in the mammalian neocortex, 
what it does and what its function is. If it, we're not interested in ideas inspired by the brain, that can come after you understand how the brain works. So we really stick to the biology. Uh, we test this uh, empirically with collaborations in experimental labs and via simulation. Uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. We have a second goal, which uh, relates to what Tommy just mentioned here. Um, and it's definitely second in our case, which is to enable technology based on cortical theory. So I'm still a believer that the, the, the way we're ultimately going to get to truly intelligent machines is we're going to, the fastest path there is to understand how the brain works. And uh, to that end, we have a very active open source community. All of our, our stuff is very open, all of our source code. You can reproduce all of our experiments. And we believe this uh, ultimately, uh, this endeavor, whether it's us or other people, will be the basis for machine intelligence as we will see it in the future. OK. Um, I just want to remind, I know everyone here is a neuroscientist, and you all know this, but I just I find it, it's a good idea just to review a few basics before I delve into this. Um, mammals have a neocortex, non-mammals don't. In the human, it's about 70% of the volume of your brain. This is my model, I carry it with me all the time. It's about this big in area, and it's about two and a half millimeters thick. And what's most remarkable about the neocortex is the consistency of the microarchitecture you see everywhere you look. It's not 100% consistent, but it's remarkably consistent. And so instead of focusing on the small differences, we really are focusing on the common elements we see everywhere. And so although different regions of the cortex do different things, it appears, and this was first proposed by Vernon Mountcastle many years ago, that cortex is cortex. And the way we see it, and the way we hear, and the way we feel, and the way we do language somehow is all based on the same sort of underlying fundamental architecture, which is just, just a remarkable thing to think about. Um, but it appears to be true. So, um, and Renner Mountcastle was also basically proposed, he says, well, the way to think about the neocortex is just think about one little section of it that goes through that two and a half millimeters. He called it a column, and he says, basically in that column you're going to have that central function. So the goal is to really understand what a column, a single, like perhaps a millimeter square by two and a half millimeters the cortex does, and if you can figure that out, you got most of it figured out. So that's what we're going to talk about today, a cortical column. Now, if you open up a basic textbook, uh, introduction to neuroscience type of thing, you'll see a picture like this. And they'll say, oh, there's a bunch of layers in the cortex. Input arrives into layer four. Layer four projects to layer two, three. Layer two, three is the output, goes to the next region. And then layer two, three projects to layer five, and that projects to layer six. That's how information flows through the cortical columns. It's actually not bad, but it's leaving out quite a bit. Um, by my count, Right now, we, are, we deal with relatively about 12 different cellular layers. Uh, layer 3 is easily divided into two. Layer 5 has three different cell types. These may not be visible layers. It doesn't mean the cells are actually stratified, but they're cells of different anatomy or morphology or physiology that can be uh, uniquely identified. Layer 6 is a very complicated layer. It has these two, uh, layer 6A and 6B, or sort of these very interesting layers, and it's got a bunch of other cells down below there. If you just follow, for example, the same as we did on the left there, the feed-forward circuitry gets complicated too. So there are actually two inputs to every cortical column, especially not the primary ones. There's sometimes you have connections directly from other cortical regions, and sometimes they go through the thalamus into there. So there's two sort of feed-forward inputs. They do arrive at layer four, among other places, but they only form about 10% of the synapses on layer four cells. About 50% of the synapses on layer four cells are shown in this blue hour through this very kind of unusual bidirectional connection between layer 6a. So if you're going to understand what layer four is doing, you can't ignore what layer 6a is doing because it's providing about half the input there. Indeed, layer four projects to layer three. That's the output layer. Goes direct to other cortical regions. But layer three also projects down to layer five. And here you see a very similar type of circuit. Between layer 6b and layer one of the layer 5s, you have a similar sort of parallel structure going on there where there's this very, a, a very characteristic bidirectional connection. Then that projects to upper layer 5, at least in some species it's upper layer 5, but it's the layer 5 thick tufted cells. And that becomes a second output of the cortical column, and that is the one that goes through the thalamus. So there's like these two sort of inputs and two outputs, and there's this complicated circuitry going on between. Now, there's a lot of known about the cortical anatomy. I'm not going to go through it, but we can summarize a few things here. We can say cortical columns are complex. They're very complex. At least 12 or more excitatory cellular layers. There's two feed-forward pathways. There's at least two feedback pathways. Uh, I didn't show them here. And there's numerous uh, connections up and down the column and between columns. And then, of course, there's an entire inhibitory circuit, uh, which has at least as many cell types 
and equally complex. So this is a very complex system here. Um, now, the function of this thing is also going to be complex. It's not going to be simple. So anybody who says, oh, it's a filter, it's changing this, it's changing that, that doesn't seem to be the case. We should expect this thing to do a lot. And in some sense, we're looking at, and this is the thing that makes us think. This is the, the, the source of everything. In fact, whatever a column does has to apply to everything the cortex does, because this is the circuitry of the cortex. So we might think about, oh, how is this going to touch, or how am I going to see with this? But it's also going to explain how we do language, and it also has to say something about how we do neuroscience and how we build buildings and so on. So it's, it's something really it, it's remarkable. Um, now, I have two thoughts about this uh, before I get into the details of my talk. Um, one is, I just want to remind myself, this is one of the most important scientific problems of all time. Uh, it's worth stating that. It's worth remembering that. Um, it's, it's up there with the discovery of you know, genetics. It's, up there. it's really kind of the core of who we are as humanity. And it's the only structure that knows things. This is the only structure that discovers things. Um, and, of course, it defines us as a species. Uh, so it's a really very uh, important thing to work upon. Now, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I've been working on this problem for a long time, and uh, like many of you, and um, what we've been doing is we've been sort of teasing apart pieces of it and trying to understand a piece, and then we find another piece, and we try to fit those two pieces together, and then so on. And uh, lately we've had some success in the, getting those pieces, and we started putting them together in relatively uh, interesting ways. And um, actually in the last month, less than a month, we discovered another piece, um, even before, after I set up this talk, and all of a sudden a whole bunch of stuff fit, fit together really, really well. Um, and so I'm going to tell you about that. It goes beyond the abstract I mentioned today in the talk. Um, at the end of my talk, I'm going to give you explicit proposals about what many of these layers are doing. I'm going to be filling in a diagram here explaining what's going on here, at least a hypothesis for that. It won't be everything, uh, but it's going to be an interesting foundation, and I'm going to make the case for that. Now, to do that in the time I have allowed, I have to move quickly through a whole series of concepts. And typically, when you give a scientific talk, you, give, you explain one concept, and you explain how you did it, and what didn't work, and your experiments, and blah, blah, blah. I don't have time for that. Um, I want you to understand that everything I present you here is not just made up. It was a lot of work, a lot of testing, a lot of, uh, it, it took a long time. And I have a lot of confidence in it, but I can't present the data to, ex to explain that, why I have that confidence. So I just want you to at least give me the benefit of the doubt that later when you ask me questions, I can go into any detail about this stuff in, in great detail. But I'm trying to tell a story here today, and I want to get to that end picture. picture. Now, the way I'm going to tell the story is the way we discovered it. It's not the way we went about our work. It may not be the best way, but it's the way, the way I know. So I'm going to start at the beginning. The beginning, all of our work was based on a single observation. Um, the observation is the cortex is constantly making predictions of its inputs. Uh, every time I feel something, I have an expectation uh, what I'm going to feel. And that expectation is a very detailed prediction. As I move my hand along this lectern, if even the slightest little dip here, I would notice it. It would be like catch my attention. Or if it felt a little funny, if it felt like jello or cold or something. So I have this, that tells me if I notice changes, I must have had an expectation of what it was going to be. And the same thing as I move my eyes. Um, I'm constantly predicting what I'm going to see or trying to. And the same with audition. You're constantly trying to predict what I'm going to say or what you're going to hear. So uh, we asked ourselves the question is, OK, our research paradigm has been, how do networks of neurons, as seen in the neocortex, learn predictive models of the world? It's not that the cortex is only building, uh, doing predictions, but it seems to be a fundamental component of what the cortex does. And if we tease apart prediction, we might understand what some of the functional components underlying that are. So that's what we went about. Now, this question, this research question, can be broken into two parts. If you think about the, the Patterns are coming into the brain. You've got these sensory streams, millions of uh, sensory bits coming into the brain, changing all the time. Why are they changing? Two fundamental reasons. Either the world itself is changing, and I'll call that extrinsic sequences, like you're listening to a melody, and you're, and you're learning the sequence, and it's the pattern in time that matters. Um, that's one form. The second form is when you move yourself. So, and you're doing this constantly. Every time you move your eyes several times a second, every time you touch something, every time you do, you know, walk around a room, there, there's a flood of changes coming in. And it's been known for a very long time, back to Helmholtz, that you can't really understand the world and those sensory inputs if you're not accounting for the behaviors that go with them. 
So it's the sensory motor sequences that are leading to those. And so that's the harder problem. So we started with the first one, and then we tackled the second one. So on the first one, we had a paper that came out in uh, uh, March of 2016 called Why Neurons Have Thousands of Synapses, a, sequence of, uh, a Theory of Sequence Memory in the Neocortex. And in there, the big idea is we suggested that every pyramidal cell is actually a prediction machine. And that the vast majority of the synapses on the pyramidal cell are actually used for prediction. I'm going to walk through that. Then we showed if you took a, 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 like a cellular layer, like you might say one of the layers in one cortical column, um, that a network of those models would learn a type of sequence memory, a very powerful sequence memory, a predictive memory. And in order, we also had to introduce some properties of uh, sparse activations to understand that. So that's in that paper. Um, then we just had a, um, a paper come out in October of this year called The Theory of Columns in the Neocortex, how the, a theory of how columns in the neocortex learn the structure of the world. In that paper, the big idea is we deduce that every column, every, you can think of it, we'll talk mostly about primary and secondary sensory columns, but ultimately I think it'll be every column. Um, we deduce that it must have a sense of an allocentric location. And I use the word allocentric in a very broad term. It just means other. I'm not using it in the term specifically as people who study like grid cells do and something like that. But really, you can think of when I say allocentric, this is tripping some people up today. You can think of it as object-centric. So when I touch this little clicker here, when my finger feels something, I'm arguing that, that the column that's receiving the input from my finger is also figuring out where it is on this object. And we'll get into that. So that was the big idea there. And then as the sensors move through, uh, over objects and through the world, you can learn models of complete objects. And I'll, I'll walk you through that. And then the third part here is our current research. And uh, this has not been published. Uh, it's very new. We asked the question, well, how, do, how could columns compute this allocentric or object-centric location? We had, if we had the idea that, well, let's look at grid cells and place cells, because um, they solve a similar problem. And uh, after we studied this for a while, we, uh, we come to believe that cortical columns contain analogs of grid cells and head direction cells, that they're solving the same basic problem is that the entorhinal cortex is using to map environments, it's been observed and it's now using to map physical structures, objects. And it's a very parallel process. Uh, and when we have understood that, now we're starting to have, understand the function of numerous layers and connections. So I'm going to go through this in order. I'm going to very quickly go through these points and end up down here with the specific functions of layers and, and connections. So I'm going to go pretty quickly. So let's start with one slide on the pyramidal neuron as a prediction system. Um, this is your typical pyramidal neuron. It has thousands of synapses, anywhere from five to 30,000 sy excitatory synapses. Only 10% or less than 10% typically are proximal. You can actually drive that cell to fire. 90% um, of them are on either the distal basal dendrites or the apical dendrites. And typically, they're completely unable to make the cell fire. Um, which a lot of great research has been done to show that dendrites are active processing elements. So if you have somewhere around 15 active synapses, uh, they could come active at relatively close in time and space. So they have to be within like a 40 micron on a dendrite segment. That it, generate, it can generate a dendritic spike. The dendritic spike can go to the soma. Generally, it does not cause the cell to fire. It depolarizes the cell. So it raises its voltage but not enough to generate a spike. That can be a sustained depolarization, hundreds of milliseconds up to a, a couple of seconds. We are going to argue that that uh, is a predictive signal. So the proximal synapses, this is our theory, the proximal synapses cause somatic spikes. They define the class of receptive field of the neuron. But the distal syn synapses cause dendritic spikes, and they put the cell into a depolarized state or predictive state. Uh, what's the benefit of a cell being depolarized? Uh, the, our models and, our, and our, our, our network models rely on that fact. What happens is a depolarized neuron will fire a little bit sooner um, than another neuron if they both have the same receptive field. They both have the same basic feed forward receptive field. The one that's going to be depolarized will generate its first spike a little bit quicker, and it's going to inhibit its neighbors in a very fast inhibitory circuit. So, and it turns out, if a typical, a typical pyramidal neuron can recognize hundreds of unique patterns, uh, 100 unique contexts in which it's going to predict its, uh, its input. Uh, this is how we model it. it when we, all of our simulations, we use this. This is a picture of our software model for this thing. Model basically in green there. That's the proximal synapses. The, and then we have a deba uh, the basal synapses we might label here context. It's an array of coincidence detectors. And then the apical dendrites are similar. These are like threshold detectors. 
So um, this is our model of the neuron. It has multiple states. I won't get into it. I also should point out the learning model here. We rely on synaptogenesis. So we're not changing weights of synapses. We're actually growing new synapses in our model um, in a very clever way that matches biology. But I'm not going to get into it. Now, the, the, what are the properties of sparse activations? We have to cover this because you won't understand anything else until I cover this. And maybe you know this already, but I don't know. So let's take, for example, we have one layer cell. It doesn't really matter. We're just going to take a bunch of cells and say it's like one layer in our, our cortical column. Let's say it's 5,000 neurons. And typically what we see is a very sparse activation. Uh, so let's say 2% of our neurons are going to be active at any point in time. So we have 100 active neurons. Now, at any point in time, there's 100. And then one, a moment later, there's another 100. And a moment another, later, there's another 100. So first question we're going to ask is, what is the representational capacity of a layer of cells? How many different ways can I pick 100 out of 5,000? Well, you're all not surprised. It's very, very big. Uh, it, which you may not know. You can type this into any browser and just say 5,000 choose 100, and it'll tell you. Um, so um, and in this case, it's 3 times 10 to the 200. That's infinite, as far as we're concerned. And we don't have to worry about that. We can pick them all day long. The second thing is, if you randomly choose uh, two sets of patterns, two activation patterns, uh, what's the likelihood, what's, what's the sort of the distribution of the overlap? How, how many cells would they have in common? In this case, it's about two. Um, but then you can say, well, what's the chance if it's going to have 10 cells, 20 cells, or 30 cells in, com uh, in common? And it, ter it turns out that it's very, very unlikely. Uh, it very quickly drops off to, like, never. Um, even though technically it could be. Uh, so you can pick random F what we call SDRs or sparse activations all day long, and they almost all overlap by just a few. So they're very, very orthogonal in that sense. Now we can take advantage of this because a neuron, what it means is a neuron can, only has to form a few synapses or uh, it doesn't have to form connections to all the cells that are active if it wants to recognize a pattern. So in this case, I say I want this neuron to recognize I have 100 cells active here. These are the gray cells. It only has connections on one of its dendrites to 10 of those or 20 of those, and it can reliably recognize that pattern. Technically, it could have a lot of false positives, but it just won't. It's just never going to happen. Um, the second thing we can do now, this is a, perhaps something you haven't seen before, uh, but maybe you have, is uh, we can ask ourselves the question, what happens if I form a union of patterns? So instead of just invoking one pattern in this layer of cells, I'm going to invoke 10 patterns. That's 1,000 active cells, or 20% of the cells being active. Well, you could say, wow, this cell is going to be in tr trouble now because it's still looking at only 10 of those synapses, and it, it could have a false positive. Uh, but if you do the math, it turns out it's just still extremely unlikely. So this cell, by connecting to 20 synapses in the whole population here, can reliably pick out that pattern, even though there's a whole bunch of other patterns going on. And you can, give, you can do unions much greater than that. We're going to rely on this, pattern, this, this property, because what we think is going on is every cellular layer in the column is representing things. And often there's uncertainty. And when there's uncertainty, it's going to use a union. Uh, and it's going to say, well, I don't know. It could be X, Y, Z, or so on. And what it means is that the networks don't get confused as it tries to resolve that uncertainty. As they bounce back and forth, they're going to essentially narrow down to the only consistent answer. Under, I'll explain some of this. But the point is, we think unions are happening everywhere. And so the density um, of, uh, of cell activity basically represents uncertainty. And when you really got something, you know what's going on, it's going to be very sparse. OK. Then we said, OK, take a bunch of those pyramidal neurons, enforce sparse activation, uh, put, the, put them in a layer like this, and we add a few more things. We're going to basically define, we're going to put cells in a mini column. So you might say 10 cells per mini column. And what the mini column, it doesn't have to be a physical structure. What we're all asking is that the cells in a mini column have a same, uh, a common feed forward receptive field property. And this is what classic Humboldt and Wiesel uh, many, many years ago. Oh, all the cells in sort of vertically aligned have some sort of receptive field property. Um, you don't have to see the mini comms, you just have to have that property. You add the cells, are, so those cells in the mini -com are going to respond to the same feed forward pattern, but they're going to form connections horizontally that are unique. Um, and uh, and uh, so that's um, here's what would happen in, in two time periods time zero and time one. If I had no predictive state, and an input comes in, it's going to activate all the cells in the mini -com because they're all equally getting this thing and they look similar. In the condition where there is a predicted, a predicted state, and I represented those by little red circles here, this means that these cells are predicting are going to be active, they're depolarized. The same input comes in, but it's going to select one of those cells. The, the, the one that, is, uh, that was predicted is going to fire first, do a very fast uh, inhibition, 
and uh, basically form a sparser pattern. The next moment after this, what will happen is the active patterns will then predict another cells. And so you can go through these sparse activations in time, um, prediction, activation, predict, and activation. And that's the basis of sequence memory. Uh, we have built this for years, and we've tested this, and we've applied it commercially. We understand it very well. Um, I'll just mention a few things. It's very high capacity, and this is important to remember. You can, in a, a, a slightly bigger network than this, we've shown can learn up to a million transitions, meaning um, that's like 10,000 songs of 100 notes each. It's really high capacity. It's surprising. Um, they can learn high order sequences. So imagine you treat and train on two sequences, A, B, C, D, and X, B, C, Y. If you show it A, B, C, it predicts D, and you show it X, B, C, it predicts Y, it doesn't get confused by the B and the C. Similarly, if I just show it the B and the C, it's going to predict both D and Y, because that's all it can do at that point in time. It does all these things automatically. It's extremely robust to noise and failure. You can knock out 40% of anything, and it still performs well. And very desirable learning properties. It's, very, it's all local learning, very simple rules. Um, I won't get into all of that. It solves many biological constraints. Uh, this is, there are many people have implemented this by now, and it's being used in some commercial applications. But it is a biological model, first and foremost. OK, we're done with the first section. Now the second section. Um, we asked how are we going to do learn predictive models of sensory motor sequences. Our first idea was said, OK, let's start with this same cellular layer. And can we turn it into a um, uh, sensory motor layer? And we said, well, here's a basic idea. Um, what if we just added a motor-related context? So instead of the context just being the previous state, we can have a motor-related context. And we were inspired because we said, look, we know that 50% of the inputs to the layer 4 cells come from layer 6a. So that's an idea. Let's go for that. And then we asked ourselves, well, what would that motor-related context would be? Um, and uh, well, this is the hypothesis. You know, by adding a motor-related context, the cellular layer can predict its input as the sense of um, And then we said, what is the correct motor-related context? We started working on this several years ago. We tried different things. Um, and they kind of worked, but they didn't work really very well. They didn't scale well, and so on. Um, but about um, just a little bit under two years ago, we had a, an insight about it. Uh, and this gets to that allocentric level. So let me use my, I, my coffee cup as my prop. I'm going to use this a lot during this talk. Um, so you can just basically ask yourself a very simple question. Imagine I'm not looking at this coffee cup. I'm just touching it. I'm familiar with it. This is uh, my, my coffee cup from my office. Um, and um, uh, I'm, I'm holding it in my hand. And I'm about to move my finger. And I can, can I predict what I'm going to feel? And yes, I can. I know what I'm going to feel. I know I'm going to feel this edge here. I also know if I touch down here, I'm going to get this little rough thing here, because this cup has a rough bottom. Um, it also has this little, little doodad here. So as I touch my finger, I, I make the predictions. Before I touch it, I know I'm going to feel. Now, how could I know what I'm going to feel? I have to know, first of all, the cortex has to know that this is a cup. You know, it has to know it, and it has to know where it's going to touch the cup. It has to know that. If I'm going to predict what I'm going to feel, it must know where it is. And that thing it's going to know is where on the cup it's going to touch. It's not relative to my body, it's relative to the cup. I need to know the allocentric location, otherwise I can't possibly make that prediction. Uh, it's deduction. And the predictions are going to be at a fairly fine, granular level. Every part of my skin touching this cup is predicting what it's going to feel. And there's a lot of them. It's not like some global prediction, it's a very local prediction. So we realize that that is a requirement, and that's where this idea for the allocentric location comes from. OK, so our answer now is, hey, let's take, if we had an allocentric location, the, the location of the cup, and I, how could we derive that? I didn't know. What does it look like? We didn't know. We just assumed we had it. So we, in the beginning, we just did experiments where we were sort of randomly made up stuff. Um, and then we also realized we really wanted a second layer to the network. Um, the second layer was what you would typically call a pooling layer. That's a term that a lot of people use. If you don't know what it means, in this case, what I mean by it is, the second layer, we're going to essentially pick a, a sparse activation of cells up there. And it's going to stay constant while the lower layer is changing. The upper layer, those cells up there are going to learn to respond to the series of individual, individual um, sparse activations in the lower layer. So if you think about the lower layer, it's sort of representing at a feature, the sensory feature, at a location. And if you some, if you basically, you're basically modeling an object as a set of features at locations. It's kind of like a CAD file. Well, it kind of makes sense. That's what else could you do uh, modeling an object? And, and what's interesting here is that the output layer, this, this object layer, is going to be stable over movements of the sensor. 
and the input layer will be changing with each movement of the sensor. You have a stable representation of the object as you move, and it doesn't matter which order you move, how you touch the object, as long as you, as long as you know the allocentric location, that magic signal. We don't know how to do that yet, but that's the magnet signal. So we modeled this, and uh, we did a lot of work with this. So with an allocentric location input, a column can learn models of complete objects, or this two-layer network cam, and by using uh, essentially different object locations on the object over time. So it's an integration time. You can both learn model objects and you can infer. I'll show you that. Now, the, the next thing we, we realized is if you had a series of columns uh, near each other, imagine they were representing uh, three tips of your finger, um, and it's going to touch that coffee cup three fingers at a time. Well, each finger is going to have its own location in the object. Each finger is going to have its own sense re-input, which those are unique. But they're all going to be basically trying to model the same object. And uh, if they're confused, they may not know what the object is. But the output layer of these are going to be three because they're going to be basically representing the same thing. And so if you formed an associative link between on the output layer, they can vote together. And um, they can help resolve ambiguity. That's the basic idea. So each column has partial knowledge of an object uh, as its sensory equivalent sensory thing is moving. And these long range, uh, range connections in the objects layer allow the columns to vote. And inference will be much faster when you're using multiple columns than with one column. Just like it's faster for me to reach into a dark box. And you, if I use one finger to figure out what I'm talking about, or if I grab it with my hand, I'll get it. Or if I was looking at the world through a straw, I'd have to move my, the straw around a bit. But if I open my eyes and see the whole thing, then I can do it very quickly. So um, there's a, this is just a little cartoon animation just to illustrate some of this. It's, uh, it's not too, too terribly accurate. It's just for illustration purposes. So imagine this finger is going to touch this cup in three locations. And I have one column, which has an input layer and an output layer. As I move towards this, this spot I'm going to touch, I have a predicted location signal. That basically invokes a union of possible sensations I might find at that location. Um, when I actually touch it, it, it get a, a sensory feature that comes in. It selects one of those sensations. It projects up to the output layer. And this thing says, I know three objects that meets this. Um, the, 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 the coffee cup, the can, and the tennis ball all meet that. So I'll form a union representation up there. Then I go to the new location. I get a new uh, location, but it basically makes a prediction about what it might sense. You actually get a proper sense and say, oh, I have this feature at this location. I pass it up to the output layer, and I eliminate the tennis ball because that's inconsistent with feeling a lip or an edge. And then I go to the final sensation here, new location, new sensory feature, pass it up, and I can eliminate uh, the Coke can be, or the soda can because it's inconsistent. If I do this with three fingers at the same time, I, the hand grasps it. I get three different locations, three different features. In this case, we're showing them the same. They pass it up. In the output layer, we can say, oh, well, column one says it could be a, 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 the, the coffee cup or a ball. The other ones, two are saying it could be the, the coffee cup or the can. You just quickly associate with each other, and you eliminate, and you're down to the only thing that's possible for the three of them is the coffee cup. So very quickly you do that. Uh, we tried this out then on a more sophisticated problem. Uh, we started with this Yale uh, CMU Berkeley benchmark, which is uh, about 80 objects. It'll actually send them to you uh, if you want. Uh, or you can just use the 3D CAD file. So we figured since some of them are, are, are perishable food items, we would go for the 3D CAD files. Uh, <laughs> and then we built a robotic uh, a, a simulated a virtual hand using the Unity game engine. We built sensory uh, arrays on each of the fingers. This thing, uh, and we built a, a multi-column array representing each finger. We used 4,096 neurons per layer per column. So if it's three fingers, that would be about 24,000 neurons, each with thousands of synapses. And not surprisingly, because it's a simulation, it worked very well. Um, but I, just a few things it's, it's to talk about here. Imagine if was, we did it with one finger, and the one finger is touching it at different places. In one touch, you can't really tell what the object is. So this is the confusion matrix, which is what the actual object is on this side, and the vertical object is what it actually what it thought it might have been. And you can see this. Obviously, the right answer is the diagonal. But in this case, there's a lot of confusion. And after the second touch, things started narrowing down quite a bit. After six touches, you're doing really, really well. And after 10 touches, you're already guaranteed to get it. Now, there's a lot of variability in this, because if you touch sort of unique features on the object, you can narrow it down quicker than if you touch non-unique features. But this gives you the general idea. Uh, we also did a lot of experiments looking at 
uh, basically the number of columns, or the number if you want to think about as fingers, but you know we can do this abstractly. Um, and of course, what we'd expect is that you know the fewer columns you're using, the more touches you have to, or the more sensations you have to have uh, to to recognize this thing. And if you have more, then it quickly settles down to basically you can do it in one sensation. And it gets harder depending on some other parameters. Like there's a lot of parameters you can make this harder or, or easier. But the point is, uh, it kind of we show that sort of characteristic. All right, so that was that big idea there. And, um, but then we really said, OK, we've got to get to the heart of this allocentric location thing. Uh, what's going on there? What does that mean? And, and as I said, we, we, we thought of that. We said, let's go look at the, the, uh, the entorhinal cortex to see what was going on there. Now, I know there's a bunch of hippocampal people here, and we were talking about this this morning. Uh, there's various reasons why we chose to model entorhinal cortex or think about it entorhinal cortex. I won't get into it, but don't get mad at me if I don't touch your favorite topic. Um, so, um, so we, we ended up here. This wasn't our initial hypothesis. We, our initial hypothesis is the cortical columns that could contain analogs to grid cells. And very recently, we realized they had to have analogs to head direction cells. That was the last missing piece that I didn't know about until just a few weeks ago. So um, let's just talk about what goes on in the entorhinal cortex. And um, uh, I won't claim to be a, um, uh, an expert in this, but we have run this by some experts. And they said, it's OK. You can say this, Jeff. So we're going to go there. Um, uh, the entorhinal cortex uh, is one of the things it does is it allows an animal, typically we study rats, um, to basically build maps of its environment to know where it is and maybe be able to make predictions and know where things are. It's sort of the foundation of other sort of navigation problems. And uh, grid cells, I won't go into all the details. If you know, We all know about them, but, uh, but some of the details are really important, but I won't get into them. Um, they allow us encode location. So the way to think about this, if you look at rooms, they're actually the same shape. I should go back here. They're the same shape, but they're, they're different in some salient feature. And so the rat perceives them as different rooms, and you would too if you were in there. And what we want to do is, is to have a representation of where the location in those rooms are. Now, the way grid cells do this thing, um, and I'll just tell you a few things. First of all, every point in this room can be associated with the sparse activation of the grid cells. So you have a bunch of grid cells. They're in these grid cell modules. But if you just looked at which cells are active and which cells are not active, it's sort of a sparse representation. And I've shown here three locations in these rooms. Every location in these rooms has an associated pattern. What's interesting about it is the locations in the room are unique to the room. So the actual coding of these locations in room one will be very different than the coding in room two. This is actually essential to the whole theory. Um, so it, A means that location in that room. That's a sparse activation. And X means that location in that room. And R means that location in that room. That is a very different uh, things. And of course, one of the most important things here is that this location is updated by movement. So even in the complete dark, if the rat is in that room and it moves and you walk forward, it, it updates its location information. And one of the clever things is, it's the integration property, is I want to go from here to there. I can go this way and then turn this way, and I get the same representation if I just went straight or went around in a circle. Um, and what's clever about this, it works even in novel environments that it's never been in before. So it may be never been in room three, but it'll have that path integration property there, even in the dark. Um, so that's kind of clever. Now, the, the rat needs to know, or you, it's fun to do this in the dark yourself. I do it at night. Um, it, it actually is fun to try to, try to see what, how good you are and what you're, what you're, how, how good at this you are. It, you need to know the orientation of in this case, the animal's head to the room. Um, and so there's these things called head direction cells. Um, these are not driven by you know, magnetic fields or something like that. They are basically a set of cells which indicate the direction of the head. The anchoring of those head direction cells is unique per room. So it doesn't really, room to room, is no, you know, it's not always aligned along an edge. But within it's always consistent. Um, and the, up, the orientation is also updated by movement. So think of it, you know, why do you need this? You need this, first of all, you're going to need to know the orientation or the head direction if you're going to know where you're going to do, end up if you move. So if I walk forward two steps, well, it depends which way I was facing, where I'm going to be. Um, also, if I, know, if I want to predict what I'm going to see or sense, I have to know where I am and which direction I'm facing, because I could be in the same location here. As the animal moves, both of these are updated simultaneously. You have to update the, the orientation. I'm going to use the word orientation because I'm trying to generalize it. Uh, orientation and the location both get updated. I might be updating just one, 
orientation, or I might be just or updating my location, or I might be doing both as I move around in a curve like that. Um, so location and orientation are both necessary to learn the structure of rooms and predict sensory input uh, in that case. So we think the same thing is going on in, uh, as the quarter column is trying to model external objects in the world. Um, you can define um, uh, a location associated with individual objects. So my coffee cup is like a room, and the points on it are going to be both unique to the, to the coffee cup and unique to the location of the coffee cup. Um, and the same thing with the pen. And, and it's going to have to be updated by movement. In this case, the movement is the, in the case of my finger, is the, the movement of my finger relative to the cup. Um, and, um, and so we have to have that. The second thing, and I only realized this recently, you also, to solve the problems of modeling of objects and modeling of structures, you need to have an equivalent of an orientation. So I've tried to show you here as a, a sort of a sensory on your tip of your finger, both at sensing point A, but from different orientations. So you can look at it this way. Um, I'm, I'm touching the, the lip of this cup, and as I rotate my finger like this, the sensation of my finger is changing, but the location I'm sensing on the cup is not. Um, Drawing is a feature of the cup, and I'm not actually sensing the feature. I'm sensing the feature at an orientation. I can't say that the feature is actually the slip of this cup in the frame of the cup, but the sensation I get changes as I move the orientation of my finger relative to the object. So we need to have something like that, too, uh, of the sensor patch to the object. Now, I, I, I should state now that I'm going to give this whole theory in terms of touch, but the whole thing applies to vision, too, and I believe it applies to audition as well. It's a little harder to think about it that. But uh, there's nothing, we're not doing anything specific here. We're really trying to talk about generic properties of sensor patches relative to things. Um, anyway, we're going to argue that this is anchored to the object in the same way that um, it is over there. And this orientation has to be updated in my movement. So our basic idea is the following. Um, location and orientation are both necessary. That is, a, a location and orientation of my sensor patch, whether it's a court, uh, part of my retina, where is it? It's where it's sensing, not where the sensor is. Uh, where you, you both necessary to learn the structure of objects and to predict sensory input uh, and to infer. Um, I view this as a deduce requirement, and, and, and therefore I don't feel it's speculative, but you may not agree with that. Um, so now, with this knowledge, we, we went back and we did the following. Okay, We started putting these pieces together in ways that... Um, uh, that are interesting, and, I, and, and this is where I'm going to lay out these sort of the basic of the theory here. Um, and uh, this is my most complex slide, so if, if I lose you here, sorry, but well, I'll, I'll bring you back in a moment. Um, hopefully, not. I think everyone here is really smart to help figure this out. You're probably ahead of me already. Um, I'm just going to upfront say, without any further justification, that layer 6a is representing orientation of the sensory patch, and layer 6b is representing location. There's reasons for this. Um, I'll get it in a second. These are both going to be motor updated. There are going to be uh, path integration type of, um, uh, and it's sort of like it's grid cell-like and head direction cell-like. Uh, and they're going to have properties similar to those cells in the cortex. Now let's follow the circuitry as information in your basic feed-forward pathway here. You've got a sensation which is arriving to layer 4. And uh, that's paired with this bidirectional connection, this very characteristic connection between layer 6a and, and, and layer 4. And what I'm going to argue there is that layer 4 is representing a sensation in, at an orientation. Now, again, if I didn't know the orientation, I'd just have a bunch of cells that look like you know, edge detectors or something like that. But in the context of an orientation, I'll get a sparse pattern, and it's a sparse pattern that represents sensation at an orientation. This is our sequence memory layer that I started with. It can learn sequences, but it can also learn sensory motor sequences, and so it forms this unique representation of sensation or, at orientation. Now, the next layer is going to be a pooling layer. Imagine if I were pooling the input as I rotate the at the same location, like this. What, just, you know, it takes a while to sink this into your head. What well, you end up with is a stable representation of the underlying feature independent of the orientation of the sensor. So I'm, I would end up with a representation of whatever the thing is I'm, I'm actually sensing at that point, independent of whether this way, this way, this way. Um, if I went through that motion, that's what would happen. Layer, and this represents the feature that is being sensed at that point. Uh, at the moment, there's no concept of object. I'm not, I'm not locating this on the object. I'm just representing what I'm sensing with my finger. Layer 3 then projects to layer 5. As we saw, that's a classic uh, projection layer. And we're going to repeat this same circuit. We're going to have the location 
information predicting the layer 5b, and that's going to now represent a feature, and this is another sequence memory. This is now, now we really have the feature at location. Our earlier experiments didn't do with this right, and they had some problems. But now, because I've added the second thing up above, now I really am locating the feature at location. This feature at location is a very simple representation. It's independent of the orientation of my sensor. Uh, and if I pull over that, um, in the upper layer here, which I'm labeling layer 5a, which really would be the layer 5 thick tufted cells in some species it's above and some species it's below, but just pretend it's this one above here, uh, that pooling layer would then be stable over objects. It would be an actual object. Um, so we have this sort of two-stage sensory motor inference engine. Now, if you think about earlier, I talked about you could share, um, you could share information between columns. Um, the only two things that are worth sharing here are the object layer and the feature layer. Those are two things that neighboring columns might also be doing in common. Everything else in here should not be projecting to other columns because it's unique to this column. And sure enough, the two primary output layers of a cortical column are always identified as layer 3 and layer 5 thick tufted cells. Um, and those basically represent the feature that you're sensing, independent of the object, and the object that you're sensing. Now, those actually can be shared to multiple columns, and those become the feed-forward input to the next, the next regions. It's worth noting that a column, oh, well, this, no, I'll keep it in the second point. A column, therefore, is a two-stage sensory motor model for learning and inferring structure. Um, this is just a deduced properties the thing about touching. And it's important to remember, a column usually cannot infer either the feature or the object with a single sensation. It's just not going to be possible. Um, you have two choices. You can take the single column and you can integrate over time by sensing, moving, sensing, moving, sensing, moving, or your eyes could be, you know, like looking at us through a straw and sense, so sense move. Um, or you can vote with neighboring columns. And both of those strategies are employed in the brain. The column to be trained has to move over the object, but the column to infer can rely on with its neighbors. Um, as I said earlier, this system is most obvious for touch. Because like, it's easy to think about these columns as being separate sensory patches that are moving independently of each other. Um, but it also applies to vision fairly straightforwardly and uh, would be suggestive that other sensory modalities would work in the same way. We spent some time earlier this week trying to map these onto whisking in mice. Uh, and I think that can be done. Um, and um, of course, as we said at the beginning of this talk, because this architecture, this structure, if this is any truth to this, if there is, um, this, this architecture is just about the cortex, so it suggests that we infer and learn and manipulate abstract concepts in the same way, the same way that we manipulate objects in the world. So the theory is uh, the, 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 the evolution discovered a way of navigating um, and knowing, mapping out environments. We had to do this a long time ago because all animals move and they have to figure out where they are and how to get home. And then there's another theory that, that's been published that the, that the entorhinal cortex is sort of this three-layer structure in two parts. And I forget the scientists who proposed this initially, but they proposed that the neocortex was actually was formed by folding those two halves on top of one another into a six-layer structure. So we think what basically happened is evolution preserved much of what's going on in the entorhinal cortex. Not exactly. It's, there's differences. Um, uh, but it preserved that, and now it's learning how to, model, learn how to model objects in the world. And in the human brain, what happened, it's now continued that, and it's using that same mechanism to model concepts. And so it would suggest of that, uh, just suggested that when we think about things, whether it's mathematics or physics or brains or neuroscience or politics, whatever, we're going to be using a similar type of thing. And what's interesting about this is, is this space, is this idea of location and orientation, they're dimensionless. Uh, they're defined by behavior, um, and they're not, they're not metric. It's not like X, Y, and Z. There's sort of this very unusual way of representing these things. And if behaviors weren't physical behaviors, but were mental behaviors like, like uh, mathematical uh, transforms or something like, you could apply behaviors to abstract spaces, um, and it suggests that this might be the, the, uh, the, the core of high-level thought. Okay, I want to have one more thing here. Um, it's, it suggests that we might want to rethink some thoughts about hierarchy uh, that we've all had for a long, long time. Um, this is a cartoon drawing, but it captures some of the basic essence of it. We think about sensory arriving at a primary uh, sensory region, labeled region 1 here, and we extract some simple features, and then we converge onto the next region, we, we extract some complex features, and then we, somewhere up the hierarchy, we, we actually start representing objects in their entirety. Um, this proposal I have today is quite different. It says that every region has columns, 
every column is actually learning complete models of the world. Very, I mean, I'm not joking, a single column can learn thousands of things. And, um, and I've only talked about what six of the layers do, there's a lot more to be done, but the idea that these things are actually very powerful modeling things, and you have a, you have a huge array of, uh, of basically models. Um, and they're all modeling the same stuff in the world. Now, a couple of things here. I'm not, I, I want to make really clear, I'm not saying that the classic view was wrong. I'm adding some new thoughts to it that, uh, that we hadn't really thought about before. Uh, one is, you, we can say, well, what's the difference between all these columns? Um, well, one of the odd things about the cortex, when we talk about uh, how regions project to each other, they never do it that way. They always project at least two, at least three regions above. It's like if, if the LGN is projecting the V1, it also projects the V2 and V4. And people say, yeah, but the connections aren't really, really strong. Well, they, they might be diverging. The point is, there's nothing that requires here a strict hierarchy. And so, you know, a, a, a secondary region could be looking over the same sensory array, but at a wider area. Now, why would it be doing that? Um, imagine I'm going to recognize the letter E. And, um, uh, and I can do this. I'm going to argue that I can do that in V1, that my, my column, every column in my column can recognize the letter E. And if, it was, if that E was really, really small, right at the edge of my, my abilities, it's only going to be recognizable in V1. Uh, because the other regions, it's just, it just doesn't exist. Um, it's, too, it's too fuzzy. But if it, if it gets a little bit bigger, then it might be recognized by the columns in both V1 and V2. But if it gets really big, then the I can't do it anymore. It's just too big an area, and I can't move over that. And so you could be representing things at different scales here, um, uh, but they're complete objects, and they're, and they're sort of overlapping. Now, what if I had two sensory arrays going on at the same time? So I have now a vision and a touch array, and we are going to basically grasp the, the cup and see the cup at the same time. Well, you would be invoking models of the cup in many cortical columns, because there would be columns on the retina that are sensing the cup, and there's columns in the somatosensory regions that are sensing the cup. And so multiple columns are trying to infer that this is a cup. They all have models of the cup. Some are derived visually, some are derived tactically, but they all have models of the cup. Now, Interestingly, if they all have models of the cups and they're all sensing similar features, it's possible that they can vote in various ways here. And one of the things we see in the cortex, there's a lot of projections which don't make sense in a hierarchical fashion. You see, you see projections from S2 going to V2. Well, that doesn't make sense in a hierarchical fashion. It makes sense here. They can be voting on cups, they can be, uh, the objects, they can be voting on features. They can go up and down the hierarchy. They can go across the callosum. So, um, and it's interesting that you can, you can form very, as long as you go to the right layers, you can form very sparse connections to different parts of the brain and it works. Um, it, you don't have to have a lot of connections to each column. You can just send one connection, a few over here, it's, it's kind of odd the way it works. But anyway, you can have these, all these connections will help vote. So the auditory, I mean, the, the tactile system will be helping the vision system, the vision system will help the, the, the somatosensory system. So little non-hierarchical connections allow columns to vote on share elements such as object and feature. And that's kind of the thing we see up here. OK, so I'm almost done. Um, the summary of the talk here is we started with our goal, uh, which is to understand the function and operation of the laminar circuits in the neocortex. Our methodology of study is to study how cortical columns make predictions of their inputs. We then uh, propose a pyramidal neuron model, which is basically prediction. We say every pyramidal neuron is basically using 90% of its synapses for prediction, and each neuron predicts its activity in hundreds of contexts, and that prediction is manifest as a depolarization. Um, we then said a single layer of neurons uh, it forms a predictive memory of high order sequences. This has been well documented. Um, as long as you have sparse activations, mini columns, fast inhibition, and lateral connections, that can be learned. We said we defined a two-layer network which forms a predictive memory of sensory motor sequences. If I have some motor-derived context, context in a pooling layer, um, and of course we propose next that that, that uh, motor-derived context is an allocentric location, object-centric location, and therefore, uh, um, and then we then we further went beyond that to say, okay, quantum columns mean are, are equivalent to location and orientation of the sensor relative to the object, and those are analogous to grid and head direction cells. And this begins to define a framework for a cortical column. It's certainly not all, um, but it's a, a potential framework which tie a bunch of things together that kind of makes sense. Uh, columns learn models of objects as features at locations using a two-stage sensory motor inference um, model. And, um, and I went through the details there matter a lot, but uh, that's the basic idea. 
And, and then the sum total of this is the New York cortex contains thousands of parallel models that are all modeling the world, surprisingly, um, in high capacity that resolve uncertainty by associative linking and or movements of the sensors. Um, there's a couple things that, that I should point out that we didn't do, um, very big ones. Uh, objects have behaviors. Now, I should point out that everything I've talked about so far is really about the what pathway. We haven't been talking about the whole cortex. We've been talking about how, how the what pathway would model structure and, and so on. Um, and if when I talk about behaviors in the what paper, uh, paper uh, um, what pathway, I'm talking about behaviors of the objects themselves. So my laptop has a behavior. The lid can open and shut, and I know that. It, also, if I touch keys, they move. I know that. This thing has behaviors, too. If I push this button, something happens. Um, objects have their own set of behaviors. We have to add that into this model, because the, the, it's not just the shape of an, or, uh, an object. It can change. And the way that we're, I think we're going to model behaviors, if you think about it, the model of objects are features at locations. Those features can move in the object space. That would happen if I'm opening a laptop lid. Or the features can change at the particular location. So if I bring out my cell phone, and it's on, and I touch something on the screen, new features appear at the same locations that they bear before. So the whole idea of modeling behaviors of objects is how features move and change at locations. We have to do that. We haven't done that yet. Um, we need a detailed model of the hierarchy, including the thalamus. I didn't talk about the thalamus. We spent a lot of time today talking about the thalamus. We have hypothesis what it's doing and why we need it, but we have to finish that out. And I also I already mentioned sort of build the complementary aware pathway. This is not a model. We haven't described anything about how we generate behaviors um, and why I might move and how I would reach something. I haven't talked about that at all. I've just talked about how would a what pathway column learn the structure of objects through movement. Uh, I want to put a little plug here. Collaborations, there are many testable predictions in this model. In some sense, a green field, because the people we're pro pro proposing that cortical columns, even primary ones, are doing a hell of a lot more than most people think. Um, and so uh, we spent a lot of time this week talking to various labs about how we could do that. And we welcome that. We're all going to have discussions and we can talk on the phone or here today and so on. And we're always interested in hosting, visiting scholars and interns. We have a couple right now. Um, and so if you want to come some, spend some time in Southern California, even for a short period of time, so we have people come just for a couple of days um, and want to get immersed in what we do. We like having visitors like that. Um, this is the team we have on the left. There's 12 people. I want to call out to specifically Sai Ahmed, who is with me right here. He's my, he's been with me. We've been partners for 12 years. Um, and he's critical to the whole thing. And Marcus Lewis is one of our scientists, and he really helped um, um, understand the interaction between layer 4 and layer 6 and layer 5 and layer 6b. I didn't really talk about his work here, but it's sort of underlying everything we're doing. And here's some insights into that. So hopefully I didn't speak too quickly, but that's the end of my talk. Thank you. <laughs>